So um, thank you for, for the introduction and uh, thank you for the invitation and uh, for, for organizing this, this great event. I, I guess we need to get more to, to, to know what's happening in Poland so that we not only look to, um, to the other places, but we know what's happening locally um, because things are great here. So, um, so that's... Uh, so I will present some, some work that I did with, with, with a lot of my collaborators, um, some of them uh, from Montreal, some of them from Wrocław, some of them from, from Google, and um, the talk will be biased towards stuff that I have done, but there will be also like great things that uh, other people did, and I uh, will just report on, on them, so maybe there will be more of what, what I did, but um, not, not everything is mine, and, and most of it is uh, due to, to uh, to my excellent friends or, or, or people that inspired me. So um, I, I would want to speak about uh, how can you use neural nets for, for speech recognition and maybe use this as, as a vehicle to, to show you how you can apply neural nets to, to, to a real problem. What can be the challenges and solutions if you, if you take an activity that we are uh, quite confident as humans to do. So you, you all run your good speech recognizers right now that are... Um, able to, to listen to my proper Polish English and, and accent. And probably as, as the talk progresses, you will be better and better at understanding me and, and, and my way of speaking. So it's a, it's a thing which is kind of easy, right? Five years old can do it. And now we would also want our computers and smartphones to do it. Um, and then I will also show some other uses of, of this technology. So how, how can we push it to solve more complex tasks like speech translation or or how can we use it in natural language processing? Um, so uh, one thing about systems that um, are made to recognize speech or, or essentially translate or, or, or do other tasks is that classically those systems, it's not like you have a speech recognizer. You have several moving parts. Uh, it's a whole pipeline. So there is something which records and does the low-level audio processing, and then there is something which uh, extracts some features on it, and then there is a, a model which roughly guesses what's in this recording, and then there is something which says, does it look like English or does it look like Polish, which we call a language model. And somewhere along the line, there is something which um, normalizes text, and there is something which denormalizes text. So you uh, want to have your capital letters at interpunction, and uh, obviously I don't say capital letter, I have started a sentence. So you have to add it. So um, you don't have a, a single system. You have a pipeline of elements, and we judge the system by how this pipeline works from one end to the other end. Uh, yet most of the time, we develop those small pieces and hope that they will perform okay if we just stitch them together. And the same goes for, for translation, um, where you have, or at, until recently, we, where you had uh, language models and alignment models and tables of how you translate phrases and wanted to make sense of this. And um, similar thing happened for uh, processing natural language, where you would build dictionaries, okay, this word can be declined in this particular way or conjugated in this way. Um, so if you see this declination conjugations, these are the possible interpretations, and then you would select a few of these. And having those few, you would want to um, make sense of the sentence. Um, and, and what's happening right now with neural nets, and something that I have tried to do, is to essentially take as much of this pipeline as possible and compress it into a single model. Um, so we are getting there. Uh, many of those things can be right now squashed into, into one, one piece of software that is easy to, to develop. And um, I will show you using the example of speech recognition how, how this can happen. So um, we call those systems end-to-end. -end, and this really means that you are developing one system in which all parts collaborate or conspire to bring the best result of their joint work, as opposed to developing those small systems that you later on glue and maybe tune some, tune some weights on, on how they should operate. And a very good example of an end-to-end -end system is actually from uh, nearly 20 years ago, uh, which was the, the system to read um, checks in the US developed by Jan Lecun, where they essentially fused um, optical character recognition with some language model, or essentially, uh, number writing um, model, and develop something that they have called graph transducer networks or graph transformer networks, and we now know are uh, conditional random field 
to essentially make sense of this sequence of predictions. Um, and you can oppose this to essentially something that would be not end-to-end, -end, which would try to do very well on those simple tasks, like recognizing digits or segmenting a word into, um, into characters, or a, and then uh, gluing them together. And we hope that if you essentially have this end-to-end -end system, you will have better performance, because essentially you optimize the end metric. You optimize the system to work well as a whole, as opposed to work well as, as those small parts that you will have some sort of a better portability because you test the system in this full use, um, that maybe it will be easier to manage because you will again observe the system as a whole, so you will not have to wonder if I change this thing in my uh, normalization, how would this affect uh, something three elements down this pipeline? And then finally, um, whenever you have a model which takes those local decisions, if you omit something, omit something you may not recover from it. And we will see examples when we, uh, at the very end of this talk, when I will show you a, a speech translation system. So essentially, in this end-to-end -end system, you would hope that the, uh, that the randomness will be propagated up to the very end. So for instance, maybe I don't speak that well, but it makes sense in the larger context. And somehow you have to have all those hypotheses of what I have said until you hear the whole sentence, and then you can make sense out of it. So if you have a system which works by those tiny pieces, the pieces at the beginning of the pipeline, they don't know this larger context, so they cannot use this larger context to make sense of those smaller uh, things that they process. And you have to have a way to push this uncertainty about the recognition through this pipeline. So in an end-to-end -end system, this sort of happens uh, automatically. And in a way, the end-to-end the -end systems are here. So there was this check reading system um, in image recognition, uh, there was a huge shift starting with the AlexNet um, towards using end-to-end -end systems. So we don't develop right now um, features uh, to describe images. Uh, we take a huge data set, run it on row pixels, and then have an interpretation of this image, and maybe reuse parts of those networks. But no one is thinking right now um, how to make a better local image feature descriptor. Should this be a histogram of gradients or sift or, or, or whatnot? Um, we have neural machine translation, which is uh, used in production since, since last year. And again, this is a place where a whole pipeline of small uh, language processing tools was replaced by one huge model, uh, which takes characters and emits characters. And then you have uh, combinations of those. So there is neural caption generation, so you can essentially take the image descriptors, but from a neural net, and then glue it to half of like a translation network and uh, translate from images to, um, to text. Uh, we have a proof of concept speech translation system which hears Spanish and prints English and you don't really have this Spanish speech recognition in the middle. So things are going in this direction. Um, if you want to design an end-to-end -end system, how do you go about it? So as, as usual, you have to reduce the system to something you can learn. So you reduce this, this problem uh, to a uh, supervised learning setup, and essentially you have your desired output Y, and you have your input X, and you want this model to be able to make this uh, estimation of this conditional probability in, in one step. And in our case, um, the X and Ys will be sequences, so these can be characters, uh, words, um, speech frames, and then uh, one problem with those sequences is that we don't have a clear alignment between the two. So you have a recording, and you don't know where the words exactly are. Or you have a translation, and you don't know how to reorder things. And um, that's the main problem, why you cannot use some simpler models that would essentially take every short segment of audio and produce one word for it. We just don't know where the word is. So um, how do you go about um, training models on sequences? Well, a, a very successful uh, way to um, to reason about sequences is to make a recurrent neural network, right? So you essentially um, define a transition function, you define what you remember from the past, and you can model those, those two functions using small neural networks. And this gives you a very powerful model of sequences. So you predict one step ahead, and you compress all of your history, this variable size input, into one fixed size hidden state. And you hope that throughout training, the network will uh, remember what's important and learn how to compress what's important into this hidden state. So um, 
This solves half of the problem, right? We want to have a conditional model of P given X, and so far we have a model of just, uh, sorry, of Y given X, and so far we have a model of Y. So the question is, um, how do we start with this, the recurrent neural network, and recover this? And the first idea is kind of easy. Uh, you just unroll this loop until the, very, until the very beginning, and then there is this first hidden state, right? The basis of, of the induction or the basis of, of the recursion. And you can condition this through the first hidden state. The other idea would be to do something at every uh, possible step, and this will be called the attention. So the first idea actually works, and that was uh, this system to caption images built by Oriol Vinials at, at Google Brain. So they essentially took a image, processed it through an image net network, and then took some layer from this network, used this to initialize the hidden state of a recurrent network over words, and then this network would essentially generate the words one by one. And, and this was able to produce proper, um, proper image captions. So that's a very valid way to, to initialize a, a recurrent neural network through, through the first hidden state. But you see that there is a problem. Like what if this image was larger? How much information can you squeeze into a fixed sized vector? And there, there has to be an obvious limit to it. So maybe this next idea of essentially uh, getting some information at every step would be better. And, and this is what was developed for the uh, Montreal Translation Project by Dimitri Bagdano. It's essentially called attention. So at every step of the recurrent neural network, you are allowed to take a glimpse into your source sequence. In this case, this is audio. So um, you have your previous hidden state. You have all the frames or all the parts or the tokens in your input, and you try to score them. And then you normalize those scores, so you get this curve, which says, um, if, I am, if I have this hidden state, as t minus 1, maybe the interesting part of the input to look at will be here. And then you just combine this interesting part into a context, this is just a sum, and use this as, an, as another input into your transition. And now at every step of your recurrent neural network, you are, okay, and now at every step um, of, of your recurrent neural network, you are getting some information, some selected piece of information um, from your conditioning signal. So uh, it's weird because you can think about the system as a, essentially a language model or, or, or a model for generating sequences, which has this uh, coupling at every step to, to another signal, and this can be very generic. So as I said, this was developed for um, translation, but even before that, there was a uh, speech synthesis, handwriting synthesis system, which had a very similar mechanism. At every step, it was deciding whether it wants to uh, continue printing this character or essentially move to the next. So there was a sliding window and at every step you would predict how to move it. And that was 2013. And then there is the translation where the attention is really crucial because it can do all those reorderings and essentially uh, here you see which word in the source, the French, was selected to print the, the English words. And then you can also apply this to images. And again, these are printouts of, of where the system is looking at, and uh, my humble contribution is to apply this to speech. And so the, um, how does a end-to-end -end speech network look like? Well, you start with uh, some representation of, of the speech signal. Um, usually you don't take the raw waveform. Uh, you take something called the MEL spectrogram, which is like a very low level uh, signal processing technique. Uh, you can start with the raw radio and make it more end-to-end, -end, but there are no clear benefits, like it's neither faster nor more accurate. Then you run some convolutions, uh, recurrent layers. Finally, you have this encoding of your um, speech into a sequence of frames. And then you run this very generic um, RNN with attention. And again, typically, um, this is so powerful that you can use characters um, instead of phonemes. So um, a, a phoneme, for those that don't know, this is like the analog of a character um, in, in speech. So essentially, it's the unit of speech that we can distinguish. So um, if you have two words that are written in a different way but are spelled in the same way, they would have the same phonetic representation. So using phonemes is uh, slightly easier because every word has a single, or every pronunciation is essentially a unique sequence of phonemes. Now this is less, um, 
less well defined. So um, you have this neural net, and the good thing is that you can train it uh, as any other neural net by just uh, maximizing the log likelihood of your uh, outputs given inputs. And this is great because if you ever try to do like a traditional speech recognition system or a traditional translation system, uh, the training procedure is not like this one step, there is a whole sequence of things. So first you try this very simple model that gives you a rough segmentation of your audio. And then you make this model more complicated. And then you try to model all of the different acoustic phenomena that can happen. And, and the training is not really one training, it's like a sequence of I don't know, 10, 10 or 15, uh, retraining of models of uh, increasing complexity. And here you can build this neural net as large as you want and then train it in one stage. So that's a, a, that's a huge shift in how you engineer those models. And then once you have trained it, um, you want to know what's in your speech and you actually use beam search. So again, this is a, the, the, the simplest decoding algorithm possible, the network gives you predictions of the next character of the next word. So you start with the empty sequence. You say, okay, network, um, what's the next character? And it gives you a, a ranking of the over characters. So you pick the few uh, which the network prefers. And then you extend all of these by one. And again and again. And you keep like, uh, actually, you don't need to keep that many. The network is fairly certain. So we have tried it. And usually, if you just keep like the 10 or 5 uh, most compelling to hypothesis according to the network, you are already doing well. So the model is uh, sort of conceptually easy to code, especially if you have uh, high-level neural net libraries like TensorFlow, um, which take the gradients for you. It's easy to train, and it's uh, very easy to decode. So, so where's the catch? Like, like usually neural nets getting those models to, uh, to work well isn't so easy. So I want to show you right now a couple of, um, say, tricks of trade, how you can uh, change parts of this network to, to work better, better and then um, zoom in on some of the issues that I have worked on. So um, the first trick of trade with neural nets is regularization. And um, essentially, we are looking for those wide optimas. And if you ever um, work with recurrent neural networks, you maybe know that they don't like weight decay too much. And that's because if you set your weights to zero, especially the recurrent ones, your signal decays too fast and you don't have that much memory. So how else? Can you have this large uh, optima, meaning that if you change your parameters by a small amount, the function doesn't change too much? And the answer is, well, add noise during training. So just show the ways that they can be large but low precision by injecting noise. And that's like the single most important uh, technique that I know to, to regularize neural nets. Just at every time step, every training step, sample uh, a little bit of noise, add it to your weights, and this essentially uh, trains the model to be insensitive to small changes in weights, and this makes a huge difference. Then um, another trick that you can do, well, since the generator is so powerful that you can work with characters, words, and so on, you don't really have to model all of those intermediate values. So again, for those of you who know something about speech, you know that um, in the classical way to do speech, um, you would want to split your signal, your waveform, into small parts which roughly look the same over time, or as the signal processing people like to say, which are stationary across time. Which means that uh, you have a phoneme, and the phoneme is not stationary. It's the onset of the phoneme, it's the middle part, and it's the outset of it. So you actually cut it into three parts. And this means that you have to have a very high temporal resolution. Now here you don't need it. So it's much better to essentially uh, reduce the sentence uh, a few times over time, I don't know, 8, 16 times, and it's just faster and, and better. And then something else uh, which, which you can do, essentially, if you take your basic LSTM cell, uh, you can think that these are multiplications, but then you can replace all of these by convolutions. And this creates a recurrent cell which respects the time frequency representation of, of your uh, speech signal. So essentially, you start with something that you can think is an image, it has time on one axis and the frequency on the other axis. And you would want the network to know this. Um, but if you apply the generic LSTM, the, the matrix multiplications um, essentially destroy this time frequency information. But you can replace all of these by convolutions. It's, it's, it's another linear operation. And then throughout the recurrent layers, at least the first few ones, um, you keep this uh, time frequency. Um, representation of the signal, then you can switch to normal LSTMs. 
And that's another way to essentially uh, have a variable number of frequencies. Um, so, or reuse parameters, like increase the number of computations for, for one parameter, so a, a cool trick. And then finally, um, since everything is a vector, you can essentially do multiple tasks at once. And this is an example from the Google Neural Machine Translation System, where um, if you see, you essentially add to your input this little token which tells you to which language you would want to translate. So essentially there is an English and you say to Japanese, and you expect the model to produce you the output in Japanese. And they, they did it like that, and this improved essentially the translation between the, the pairs of languages, but it was also able to translate on pairs for which you didn't have data, which is really cool, they, they called it zero-shot translation. And that's possible because you don't engineer your features, you have everything in some abstract vector space, and in this abstract vector space, um, you can train the model to have the same uh, representation for many languages. And finally, a, a, a new development from NIPS this year, from also from people in Google Brain, they essentially said, if you have this um, attention thing, which can essentially look forward in time, backward in time, maybe you don't have to use an RNN to compress history over time. Maybe you can essentially only use the attention. And if you do the attention over your past states, this is a good summary of the past. You don't have to squeeze it into a hidden state. If you want to have the uh, analog of a bidirectional recurrent neural network, which is one where the signal runs forward in time and then backwards in time, and at every time step you want to know something about the past and something about the future, you just run the attention over your past and your future. And, um, You don't use the encoder RNN. You use this. You use this self-attention mechanism, backward and forward in time. There, there, there is no. The only way that you look at the past or the future is through this attention. But how do I uh, count these weights uh, for the attention if I don't? Because there are some functions oh. of uh, hidden state of the encoder and the encoder. Mm -hmm. So you have a sequence of hidden states. It's a different way to compute this sequence. You don't have to compute it using this recurrent computation. Okay. So, so, so you have multiple layers, and um, it's actually very nice because if you have short sequences, this is faster than the usual RNN. And they show in the paper why, so please check it out. So um, I, I hope that this sort of convinces you that this mechanism is, is, um, is general, and I, I would want to spend a little bit of more time of, on, on wh what I have done with, with those kind of models. So a few challenges that I try to solve. One of them is overconfidence of those models. The other one is how does this scale to long uh, sequences? And then finally, uh, what about adding some other data like some language models? So maybe let's start with the overconfidence. So if you train those models, usually you end up with something like that. Um, you have your next step predictions. You take a sum of these. This is the ground truth, so what the model should produce, and it has a log probability of minus 25, which if you take e to the minus 25 is really, really close to zero. But then you look at what the model has found, and this has a total log probability of minus 3.7, which is um, much larger. And the problem is that most of your uh, costs are near zero, and then there is this single mistake which costs you uh, about 11 or 10. So this is like half of this, half of this log prop, and you maybe didn't notice it because it's small, but this is a different scale. This one goes to 12, this one goes to 0.7. So essentially, the model is terribly overconfident, and that's a usual problem with neural nets. Um, even if they are very good at telling what the first uh, answer is, you know, like their first guess versus their second guess, they will not tell you, uh, even if both of these make sense, the neural net will not tell you which, which of these is, is, is really the, the more important one. So essentially, uh, the model is really, really, really accurate at those next step predictions, 99.9 .9 accurate on train, 96% accurate on test. And the probability of the first guess is much better than the probability of the second guess, even if the second guess also made sense. And this really means that um, if you only use this network to produce one output, say you do image classification, it's okay. The, the first guess is good, the second guess is also good. The first guess looks as much better than the second guess, but it's not a huge problem. If you are using this for structured prediction, and this would be an example of structured prediction, you essentially decode the first letter, then based on the first letter you decode the second one and the third one, 
So you compound those predictions at various time steps. Now you sort of would want to see that the first guess of the network was nearly as good as the second one, um, but it doesn't show you this. So it's extremely hard to, um, to decode a meaningful list of uh, competing hypotheses with this model. And um, this is also the reason why this beam search was so nice. Like you could essentially run greedy search and this was good. That's because the network doesn't provide you with meaningful alternative, alternatives. And why does this happen? So maybe first I, I wanted to evaluate, um, are the predictions of the network properly ordered but just uncalibrated or is this totally off? So I did this very simple experiment. I just varied the temperature of the softmax, which makes I artificially made the predictions of the network smoother or, or, or more sharp after training. So we start with the baseline one, and then we uh, make it sharper, and this gets worse. And then I made it smoother and smoother and smoother and smoother. And so it looks like, um, essentially, if you just smooth out this distribution, you get to better results. So the, f the first guess of the network, the greedy decoding, it's it's the same for all of these, it doesn't change what's your first guess, but then the, the network orders stuff in the proper way. It's just that it tells you, okay, the first one is so much better than my second guess, but in reality they are sort of the same, and if you just equalize them later on, this is, this is good. Um, so why does this happen? Well, it's essentially an, an effect of how we train the networks. So we train them with cross entropy, this means that the cost function looks like that. And when your model is 99% accurate, and uh, this, this is usually the case if you train this because the this, this signal is quite deterministic, how can the poor network lower the cost? Well, the only way to lower the cost, if it already predicts the correct guy, is to essentially make this um, as close to the Dirac delta, this, this probability as possible. That's the only way uh, for the net to lower the cost. So you sort of build the, you, you have an output which is a softmax, you call this probability, but you build into your training procedure um, a tendency of the network to overfit or to, to be overconfident. And um, a simple solution that took me a while to realize, but people were doing this for, for images uh, from a few years, is essentially don't show here that the network should put all the probability mass on the correct sample. Tell it to put a little bit on the correct one, it's, well, tell it to put like 90% on the correct one and spread the remaining probability over the other guesses. It's, uh, it's kind of weird. You tell the network that, okay, there is this correct answer, but we also want you to put a little bit of probability mass on the incorrect ones. But in the end, this prevents the network from being so sure about your one correct um, target. And this, this makes a lot of difference in, in practice. So two things happen. First of all, this, um, if you look at the gradient through the softmax, it approaches this, this value, and if this is close to one, and then this is also one for the correct class, this vanishes. So you essentially stop training. If the network is very accurate, you, you have no meaningful gradient, and um, it stops to train on the correctly trained classifiers, so no signal flows through the uh, deeper layers of the nets, and then, of course, you have this um, overconfidence problem. Um, so when you apply this label smoothing, it essentially prevents this network from having those high outputs. And to be honest, that's what every other regularization wants to do. So every single regularization technique uh, will have an in interpretation in which you would look at it as essentially trying to make the network um, have less gain or preventing the network from outputting a very large change in the outputs uh, for a small change in the inputs. And for instance, um, if you take weight decay, essentially the the Jacobian of a layer is just the, the weight magnitude. If you, make, if you make your weight small, this means that you don't want your model to have a huge output swing for a small um, input change. And this label smoothing is another way to tell this to the network, okay, no matter what are your inputs, you cannot change the labels too much, and maybe it's just easier to control. Like, you don't really know if you have a deep network, and maybe you have some values, you have many symmetries on where your large weights are. You don't have a good way to say uh, how large your weights should be but it's much easier for you to say, okay, uh, I want to have a certain entropy on the outputs. So maybe it's just easier to, to use. And what changes with this label smoothing is that essentially uh, you don't have those zero cost predictions. The network pays a little price to emit every character. That's built in because you don't, you train it not to put a 100% probability mass on the correct one, 
Um, but it also makes the alternatives to the greedy decoding, to the one best decoding, more meaningful, and it makes it easier to, to integrate other costs like, like a language model. And then I also repeated this experiment with the uh, temperature tweaking. And in the case of this label smoothing one, you, well, first of all, it's much better from the start. And second of all, uh, the temperature equals to one, the baseline curve, it's actually the best one. So right now the predictions are more calibrated if you do it properly. Like if the network says that something is twice more probable, one hypothesis is twice more probable than the other one, this is more close to the truth. Previously the ordering was correct, but the, um, the ratio of the probability was meaningless. Now it's more, more meaningful. All right, so um, another thing I, I investigated with those networks is how, how do RNNs behave with long, long input sequences? And uh, the answer is that um, from the start, they, they don't work so well. So essentially, uh, a very simple experiment to run, you train a network, and then you just start to decode it with much larger inputs. And um, it turns out that this completely fails on very long input sequences. And that's just because the network never saw those during training, and apparently that's a huge domain shift when you generalize from short sequences to long um, sequences. So I wanted to take a look at what's, what's really happening in those attention-based nets, and it turns out that um, you can concatenate the utterances and look what's happening with the attention. So it would track the proper output for a while, and then essentially find something nice near the end and jump till the end. And uh, I thought that this is essentially because of some encoding of where you are in this se 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 sequence. So you have this bidirectional recurrent neural net. One of them tells you I'm something somewhere close to the beginning. The one in the reverse direction tells you I'm something close to the end. There you decode for a while and the network says, okay, I guess I'm halfway done, so let's jump to the end. And it does so, and it stays at the end for, for a very long time. And, and the solution that we did was essentially to um, build into the network a, an explicit location tracker. So um, another way to look at it, if you, have, if you have speech and you have repetitions, where do you know if you just look at the contents if on the acoustic contents of the input, where do you know at which repetition you should attend to? Well, you don't, so it's, there has to be a location tracker somewhere. And we wanted to make an explicit one. So we just added the uh, attention, the weights of the attention from the previous step and allowed the network to take a look at them. And now it knows, okay, I am here, so the next sound to look for would be somewhere here. And um, this actually resolved this problem. There is a performance decrease if you go into longer and longer um, sequences. This is number of repetitions, and that was essentially as much as I could squeeze into the memory I had. Um, but, but the zero saturates, and um, essentially uh, you can decode uh, longer, longer things. So then um, a third problem that I was looking at with those models, and this is a sort of shaky ground for me because I was advocating end-to-end -end models, and then it turns out that it always pays off to add more data, and in speech recognition, uh, there is so much more text-only data than text plus speech data that it's nearly always a good idea to, to add a separate language model. Um, so I was looking how to add it. And again, there is a kind of an obvious problem. So in a language model, uh, you pay a certain price to emit every word, right? So longer, longer sentences are less probable than the short ones. And the same goes for your um, recurrent neural net. It also pays a small price for every, um, for every token it emits. And there is a special end of sequence token that is really unprobable, but it has a fixed price. So if the net is smart, it would emit the end of sequence token at the beginning and says done. The sentence is long. The total price I will pay for it is way larger than the end of sequence token. So let's just say I'm done. And this is what's happening. So um, this is the ground truth and the uh, log probabilities. This is what gets decoded without any special incentive to the net to decode longer, um, longer sequences. Uh, and then this is if you just plug the empty sequence. The empty sequence isn't decoded because it's not in the beam, like essentially beam search. It's, it's an artifact of beam search. If you run the decoding with an infinitely wide beam, you would, you would decode this, this, this bad thing. So there is a problem. Um, how do you uh, promote long transcripts? And one solution is just to say, okay, um, let's, let's add a little term here, like a bonus uh, for every, let's add a little bonus for every character, every word you, you generate. 
But then there is another way that you can maximize this cost with the bonus. It's essentially to emit garbage. Like the network isn't tied to, um, to the input. It's a very loose coupling. You can just as well um, go back in time and start repeating your sentence if you give it enough bonus for just outputting long, long sequences. Um, so this, this doesn't work that well. And um, what I did is I thought, okay, but we have this attention, so we can kind of see which parts of your input are, are transcribed and which are not. And maybe let's add this bonus uh, in a saturating way. So essentially we put a threshold like point, point 0.5 and we say, okay, if, if a frame was selected by the attention mechanism uh, with the cumulative attention more than point 0.5, let's count this frame as transcribed and add a bonus. But if you transcribe it again, you don't get the bonus. So there is this area of under curve that we track. And essentially this can't loop. Like in the end it will transcribe all frames and the bonus will saturate. And this helps. So, um, these were, these were my contributions to this, and now I will get back to the, to the other ones which are needed if you want to have a state-of-the-art system. And um, one of them is called scheduled sampling, and it tries to solve a problem called teacher forcing. So um, when you train the network, you always show it the correct sequence of characters or the correct sequence of words. So you have this really long and difficult word, such as deciduals. And and at every point in time when the network makes a prediction of the future, it has the correct prefix. But then you start decoding with the net and it makes the first mistake, and then the second one, and then the third. And then suddenly it's in a place that it has never seen before. During training you have never shown to the net a situation where it made more than uh, zero errors. So, um, so the scheduled something which was invented by, by Sami Benjo at, at Google Brain is essentially a, a very small tweak to training you allow the network to make mistakes. So at every step, you essentially flip a coin, and sometimes you feed the prediction of the network, or even an explicit mistake, and sometimes you feed the ground truth, and then the network uh, isn't trained on only the correct transcripts, it's also trained on some of the uh, incorrect ones, and, and this alleviates this problem of uh, shift from the training time, you only see correct prefixes, to testing time, you see your own mistakes. And then um, taking this idea uh, slightly, or extending this idea is essentially, uh, we augment the cross-entropy cost, the one that we use to train the network, with an expectation over the amount of mistakes we, we will do. And if you do it, um, one way to do it, uh, which is an easy one, you essentially take an n-best list, so you run a beam search, you take your 20 or 100 different hypotheses from your beam search, you compute the error rate between the ground truth and what you had in your beam. Uh, you normalize the probabilities so that your beam is actually, uh, you normalize over, the, the, over your beam the probabilities, and you add this little cost to your training. And it's another way to introduce the mistakes that the model is doing um, into, your, uh, into your training. And if you take all of these tricks together, that's how you get a, a state-of-the-art uh, system. So that's, uh, these are the results of a huge, um, huge work uh, between Google Brain and, and, and the speech team where essentially they, they have brought the attention models uh, to a performance similar to hybrids of LSTMs and, uh, and HMMs. And essentially the ingredient will be lots of data, uh, so 12,000 hours of transcripts, it's actually a, a lot for speech recognition. Even when you have that much data, uh, you need to have regularized, so there was label smoothing, there was scheduled sampling, there was the minimum error rate sampling. Then they also actually used uh, several attentions instead of just one. And um, two other um, additions would be, uh, you don't want to use characters, but you also don't want to use words. So you use something called word pieces, uh, which are essentially short, short but common sequences of characters. And uh, this improves your performance in terms, meaning accuracy slightly, but it speeds up your decoding by actually quite a lot because your decoder makes uh, the number of steps, well, it's the length of your sequence. If you have not letters, but pairs of letters or triplets of letters, um, you essentially decode twice as fast or three times as fast. Um, but you are still able to spell everything out because you can build any word out of, those, out of those word pieces. And also, even if you have that much data, it actually pays off to add uh, even more uh, text-only data in the form of a language model. So, 
Uh, that's how you get a, a state-of-the-art um, speech recognition system. All right, so um, uh, right now I would want to um, show you a, a few other uh, systems which use those uh, attention-based models to, to solve other tasks. So one of them would be a, a, a speech translation system that we, we did as a proof of concept um, with, with Ron Wise from, from Google Brain. So essentially, we, we had a corpus of uh, Spanish speech um, that someone translated into English. And the main motivation to see how this end-to-end -end system would perform was essentially this problem of uh, compounding the errors between the speech recognition part and the translation. So if you recognize the Spanish and you make mistakes, how do you have your translation system recover from it, or how do you transmit this uncertainty about your um, speech recognition to the translation system? If you glue the two things together, uh, you don't essentially have to deal with this problem. And um, so, uh, so our approach was really, okay, let's take the speech recognition network and just uh, pretend this is, this is English instead of Spanish and, and see if this works. And uh, in fact, it does. But then um, we also had this problem, okay, in our data you actually have this uh, Spanish speech and you have the Spanish text and then you have the English text. So how do you use all of your data? If this were a concatenation of a speech recognition model and a translation model, it's obvious, right? You have to have the Spanish data, the Spanish speech to train the, the, the ASR system. Um, but here you don't have to have it. You can train it essentially uh, just from Spanish speech and English text. But you can also build two models. One of them which does the, uh, say, Spanish to English translation, and the other one which does the uh, Spanish to English speech translation. And then you just share the weights of those two parts in this multitask setting. And you can also do the same for the acoustic part. So we essentially either have a Spanish to English speech translation or you have this Spanish to English um, speech recognition system. And again, you share the, you share the weights. And that's, uh, this multitask training is the most obvious way to, 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 to use all the data you have. So it's similar to, to what the translation, translate team has done with, with translation. And, and it works. Um, actually, the visualizations are, are nice. So this is, uh, these are the attention matrices from a model um, which used a shared encoding of the speech. So it was either Spanish speech to Spanish text or Spanish speech to English text. And uh, you see quite a few things. So first of all, um, for the speech recognition case, this attention roughly goes left to right, which makes sense. I mean, the transcription is in the same order as um, for the, uh, as in the audio, it's also very sharp. So the the emissions are actually localized in time. For the translation, there is some reordering happening and this is less localized. But if you look at a specific word or pairs of words, so for instance, leaving here, viva aquí, actually this, this is here at the end of the sentence in Spanish and the English emission happens also at the same place. So the model makes sense. It actually learned where are the sounds for the uh, Spanish and started to emit English there. But there is also another weird thing which is happening if you see there is a little bit of this uh, attention mass here at the first frame, and essentially it looks like um, it's looking into the recording to start emitting a word, and then it knows what kind of English word this is, so it doesn't look anywhere into the, into the audio. It just looks uh, somewhere at one selected frame, the first one, and finishes to emit the, to emit the word, and then it moves to the other one. It takes a peek into the other ones, and then uh, finishes it from, just from memory. So that's where you really see the power that this is a language model, something which generates a language which is kind of coupled on, 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 on the input. So um, just to show you that this, this really works and that you, you have some improvements of this, uh, the, the only numbers I, I, I will show today, um, we had this data, so um, it's actually quite challenging because these were people that were calling their families or people they know over phone, and then someone transcribed it, so this is spontaneous speech with people you know, um, so you speak fast and change topics all the time. And so we trained our baseline models. So this is the speech recognition model, and uh, lower is better, ours is slightly better than the other ones. This is like a, um, Classical speech recognition system. This is a system which uses LSTMs and HMMs, and this is our attention-based system, so it's uh, pretty the best. 
And uh, then this is the Spanish to English translation system, and this is blue, so um, here, sorry, here is where the error rates, lower is, lower is better. Here is blue, higher is better. And um, here, actually, we had huge trouble with overfitting, like it was too little data for an, for an attention system to properly work. So ours is uh, close to the, to the best classical one, but uh, slightly worse. But then you can glue the two together, and essentially, uh, this is the, again, the blue, so uh, the translation metric, higher is better, for our cascade. So you take the speech recognition results, you feed them into the uh, translation system, and you get something decent. It was actually, even this cascade was better than the, than the other published results. But then when you train the system without looking at the Spanish transcripts, just from Spanish speech to the English text, you get something which is um, slightly better and then when you do this in this multitask setup where you add um, more data, essentially, you use all the data you have, it, it gets much better. So um, that's a good point for this end-to-end uh, -end system. And uh, we also looked for sentences where you clearly see uh, that the model has helped you. So there is this um, Spanish uh, sentence about dancing salsa. There is this phrase merengue y salsa. And essentially, the salsa or merengue doesn't appear in any of the top 10 uh, hypothesis from the speech recognition system. And so uh, it's kind of obvious that the translation system, having this input, it will not produce salsa because it's not in the transcripts. So why, why would it be there? Whereas the uh, system trained end-to-end -end for a speech translation it actually captures this salsa. So somehow it has learned better to transmit the uncertainty of the uh, interpretation of the input than just the end-best list. Okay, so um, last example, going more to, to work I did with uh, actually Michal, who is there uh, at the university. <laughs> so we wanted to look into parsing. We took a system from Brain where they said, okay, if you want to parse a, a text, you have to produce a tree. You can linearize the tree, and then it's just like translation. You have a sequence of inputs, the words. You have a sequence of outputs, uh, parentheses plus words. So let's just make a translation. And uh, we thought, okay, but you can also um, essentially look at the attention where it points to, and maybe uh, there is a system of parsing which essentially uses this information. So every word points to its uh, head word, and then there is this special root token uh, to which usually the, the verb should point. And uh, here, the, the, the one, the, the verb is pointing to root. And essentially, uh, that's how you can build an attention-based parsing system. So it's, it's easy, it's, it's even easier, like essentially um, for every word you have to predict where its head words are. And then having the word and its head, you predict the dependency type. Now we wanted this to run on Polish being from Poland, so we thought, okay, but how do we represent um, words? Probably a one of n encoding isn't the smartest one because we know that um, the, the way you spell the word actually carries a lot of meaning about it. So we took a system from, from Harvard um, where they run convolutions on the letters. So these are filters that look for prefixes, suffixes, infixes. Then you do max pooling. This creates you a fixed size representation of your, um, of your word, and you can feed this into the network. So essentially, we, we build this um, huge parsing network which reads um, characters and then um, uses the orthographic representation of the word to produce the, the word embedding. Then there is a bidirectional recurrent neural net which runs on the word embeddings and tries to make sense of a word given its context. And then finally you have this uh, part which uh, essentially is tasked with showing where is the, the head word. Um, so we call them the reader, tagger, and parser because these were roughly the, the functions that they would do if you assemble the system. Um, from pieces this would be a morphosyntactic dictionary, that would be the tagger and then a, a parser which runs the tags. Um, but then it turns out that for Polish, you have actually uh, very little data for parsing. So uh, 8,000 sentences in, isn't too much. But we have the post tags So there is a possibility of using multitask learning, essentially branch the outputs from here and train this as, as a tagger, right? And then there is also check language. And for whatever reason, the checks have annotated 10 times as much uh, as the Polish people, but then Czech and Polish is similar, so maybe again this multilingual training would, would do something meaningful. Um, so we made this system which uh, 
use this uh, multitask, multilingual representation. And uh, I guess it works quite well. So this is a, a, a recent system from Google. Uh, we are better than it on a couple of languages. We are worse than a couple other languages. I am quite pleased to know that it was good on ancient Greek. So a language that... <laughs> Uh, it's hard to find experts these days, and there are no native speakers. Uh, this is a, a, a huge power of machine learning if, if you have data. And then um, in this table, uh, actually, we tried to share different parts of the networks between Polish and Czech, and it seems that um, the, the quality and the amount of Czech data is so large that it makes sense to essentially even share the uh, character to, to, to where the presentation and the system keeps on improving. Um, so. A couple of other things. Uh, can you parse this? So that's the Jabberwocky from the second part of Alice in Wonderland by Lewis Carroll, and uh, it was translated into Polish, and that's how our parser works on it. So essentially, um, if you can make some sense of it, that's good, and uh, actually our system can make also some sense of it, so the green, uh, the green one are, are, are the part of speech tags that it got okay and it also parses this, this correctly. Um, and this is mainly the, uh, a feature of the character representation and the fact that in Polish, the, the way you spell a word, the way you, you, you write a word actually carries a lot of meaning about uh, uh, its function. So, so I guess this, this was a small success even though it's uh, quite hard to publish things on Polish on English speaking conferences. <laughs> um, but we also made the mix with Russian, and then that's another cool, cool result. So essentially, um, you can see that the similar Russians, well, the Polish words and Russian words by grouped, were grouped by their suffixes. And again, you can um, discover that the, the adjectives and so on are grouped by the suffixes, even though the, the way you write those is different. Well, one of them uses the Cyrillic alphabet, the other one uses the Polish one. So for instance, you have this koi and noi, uh, which would be the uh, analog to Ove, and those words are uh, grouped together. And it can also like, di discover that a three-letter suffix is the same as a two-letter in, in Cyrillic. So, um, so it is able to discover those cross-language uh, relations if you just train a model which is supposed to parse Russian and Polish at the same time. All right, um, so uh, I guess it's time for me to conclude. So uh, Andrei Karpaty coined the term software 2.0, and he said that those end-to-end -end systems will, will essentially be the software 2.0, and you have seen a, a few examples of these. So essentially, you, you replace one uh, pipeline uh, of, of moving parts with one homogeneous system. And uh, this changes uh, in, a, in quite a large way the way you deal with software. Um, because first of all, you hope that uh, since this is the one system, all of, this, all of its parts conspire together to, to be better at the task you are solving. The system is also fairly uniform, and um, the operation, whenever you look at it, it's like low precision floating point matrix multiplication. So this uh, will have an impact on the way we do hardware, and then um, Google has a neural net uh, accelerator called TPU, and at NIPS there were a few other startup companies that were building their own TPUs, so probably we will uh, soon see uh, those uh, computational accelerators just because the end-to-end -end system use slightly different operations. So the low, low precision matrix multiplication chip uh, will, will be here or, or is here. Um, and then if you want to improve your system, it's kind of easy, even though costly, like get more data, train a larger model, add dropout, get more data. And if you want to have a system which is faster, you essentially say, okay, uh, let's make the model twice smaller. So it will use uh, less uh, floating point operation, and that's it, it's faster. You don't have to think of a better algorithm. You have this whole curve of model size versus uh, accuracy versus speed, and you just pick a point on it. Um, but then there are also the open questions. So how do you make unit tests for this model? How do you make sure that this model actually works uh, over time? So for instance, for those language-related uh, things, um, say you build a, a language recognizer for your phone and people use it to query Google, 
and then they are the hot topics and they vary day by day. So how do you essentially incorporate the knowledge about the hot topic today into a system that was trained half a year ago? Because the way we pronounce things doesn't change at this time scale. Um, then the, the bad question is what to do if there is little or no data? So it's very cool that we can make a, a speech translation system, maybe we can make a speech-to-speech -speech translation system, but um, probably no one will essentially give us data for every pair of languages. Uh, this doesn't scale too well, so um, how do you go over, uh, over about it? Um, and then uh, there are always those special cases, and the more end-to-end -end you go, um, you, you have to incorporate them somehow. So I guess that this will be, uh, this will be very interesting to see how, how we tackle this two opposing forces. We want to have a system which is a monolith because it's much easier to maintain, uh, it's maybe easier to understand, but then we also want to tweak it in some parts and um, how do we make those tweaks meaningful. So thank you and I hope you have questions. <laughs> <laughs>